And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, Cri coming, to us coming to us straight from the Four Horsemen universe, with... Now, now, after venturing in, after venturing in, um, six, in over sixty novels by dozens of authors, it's now making its way into the strange new world of sa of savage worlds, um, with rules of engagement. Today, I ha today I have the one, the one and only John R. Osborne in the temple. How you doing today, man? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing good. I had to dump a bucket of cold, of ice water on my head to cool off, but I'm good. Yeah, it is a uh, cold beer weather indeed. Mm -hmm. Or 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 cold and or cold anything. I'm not picky, as long as it's cold. But I'd like, but with I'd like to open with the tradition of the humble beginnings. In a sense, so walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Well, role-playing games for me has been a long-time passion. Back when I was about thirteen, fourteen, circa mm -hmm. nineteen eighty, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I got it in my head to go to the local department store and buy a D and D box set. Mm -hmm. And because at that point I was already a science fiction and fantasy nerd. Um, and then, of course, I, I read the, the rules and realized that I was going to have to teach my friends how to play if I wanted to play this game and became a dungeon master right off the bat. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuck with me over the years. To this day, I still play Dungeons & Dragons as well as other role-playing games. Yep. Now, when it came... Now, um, obviously... Yeah. Rules of engagement is using the is using um, the Savage World system, specifically the system that the version of it that is been affectionately nicknamed "Swayed" by everybody. Um, That's correct. And what I'm curious about is how did you first get introduced to set to Savage Worlds? Because it's a hell of a leap to go from Dungeons and Dragons to Savage Worlds. Well, when we were looking at doing a role playing game for the Horseman Universe. Um, there is, of course, the option to do a D20 clone, mm -hmm. which, you know, all the cool kids seem to be doing, but um, the D20 bubble was already bursting. And to be honest, the, the stratified uh, structure of the D20 system didn't really seem to fit the full horseman universe. I wanted something that was more of a core, gener uh, core generic system that we could plug into the universe. Mm -hmm. And it was more skill-driven rather than levels. Um, I'll be asked. My first, my first system I looked at was Cortex. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I'm assume I'm assuming you're referring to Cortex Prime, as, in its well, yeah. form. It originally started as the uh, Serenity role playing game. And so that that'd still be um, plus, right? Um, and so you know it went through uh, Serenity, Firefly, uh, Battlestar Galactica, uh, Marvel Superheroes, a few other uh, mm -hmm. properties. Um, however, at the time. Uh, Margaret Weiss had uh, licensed the game over to another person um, and so that whole system was in a state of flux. Mm -hmm. and even though I liked the, the, the system, uh, there was no way to tell what was going to go on with it. And then I was poking around and I saw somewhere someone said, well, you know, Savage Worlds is, is kind of like Cortex. And I played Savage Worlds once or twice at conventions. And so I uh, checked it out, and I realized that it would be a really solid fit for the Four Horsemen universe. And as I did more research, I saw that they had a very strong licensing program. They have a, a very big uh, you know, third-party licensing uh, community. Mm -hmm. That's something that really appealed to me, because then not only do you have, of course, Four Horsemen players that would be interested in it, but then you have this whole body of Savage World players that could also be interested in this. Mm -hmm. Now, 
when now when it com when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the setup of um the of the four horsemen universe and i i can def i can definitely see why you would say that savage worlds would fit from what from what i've gleamed in my cursory glance cuz it's definitely on the gonzo end of um science fiction and space opera um i were were the, you had mentioned you had mentioned before that the stratification of D twenty didn't wouldn't um fit. Were there any or was there any specific things that that come that come to mind as far as if you were to try and use any sort of D twenty any sort of D twenty it just it just would it would just completely clash with the system. Well, I mean, I think the big factor is the uh, the mecha combat. Um, because you need a system that mm -hmm. will. Because with Four Horsemen University, it's kind of unique because the mechas aren't like you know ginormous machines like, for example, in BattleTech. You know, your average Casper stands around eight and a half, nine feet tall. It's really a, a you know buffed up uh, suit of power armor. I think kind of like Hulkbuster size, um, but you still got a person in it as opposed to a vehicle that you drive around from a cockpit. Mm -hmm. However, because we have several large aliens in the universe that go you know toe to toe with Caspers. We needed a system that could reflect that, but then also would uh, allow the players to participate in the battlefield if need be outside of a Casper, and not just be you know a, a bloody stain. And D twenty has this very very linear progression. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm sure if you're familiar with it, you know, for example, like look at your hit points. You, know, you start off with say you know 10, 15 hit points, and then you know. Uh, halfway through, the, you have you know seventy to one hundred hit points, and it, really the way it ramps up makes it really hard to uh, manage a long term campaign. Mm -hmm. Where Savage World is a much more, I feel, uh, character based engine. Yeah, uh, and uh, it, it lets you focus more on a character story rather than progression. You know, in D twenty system, it's always about getting that level. Get that level. You know, what new, what new things do you get for level seven? What do you get for level eight? Um, mm -hmm. That isn't as. Big, I mean, you have progression in Savage Worlds, but it isn't as stark. And one of the things I like about Savage Worlds is it lets um, different kinds of characters adventure side by side. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, you know, on the, one of the absolute uh, options for uh, the Four Horsemen universe, is being able to play some of these aliens. Well, we had to have a system where, starting off, the alien wouldn't just totally outclass the humans. There had kind of a way to do checks and balances, which with the Savage Rules character building system, there is. Mm -hmm. Now, take... Now, um... <laughs> Taking that into account, I do want, I do want to, I do have a few questions regarding regarding the setting with um with four horsemen. Um. Mm -hmm. Now, would you cons? Now it's very it's very clear that there's definitely the fantastical element when it comes to when it comes to the setting. But how how where would you how would you skip how would you um rate it on a fantastical scale are we ta are we are we shooting more f are we shooting more for star wars are we shooting more for um battles are we shooting more for um since you mentioned serenity we shoot more for firefly what's the um where is where is it on that particular spectrum it is more towards i would say the firefly spectrum i mean there isn't a lot of fantastical elements in the four horsemen universe mm-hmm I mean, obviously you have high technology, but there there is no you know psionics or you know magic abilities or laser swords. You know we don't have artificial gravity in the Four Horsemen universe, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and in that matter, it's almost kind of uh, like the Expanse. And that's th that's definitely something I can see and. One of the one of the big things that I'm that I'm always concerned I'm always concerned about when a uh, when a novel or any sort of IP makes the jump into um, a role playing game adaptation is 
how how much for, how much forward knowledge would be necess, would be necessary is is it going to be a case where somebody is it would be compl would be um, completely comfortable even if they don't have any knowledge of the um, four horsemen universe um, books that that is a uh, that is my design goal mm -hmm. i want i want this book to be something that a, a savage worlds player or any gamer interested in, you know starting to play savage world could pick up and gather what they need from the setting from just that book alone. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we hope that that'll encourage them to go and read the books, but um, I don't want to make it required reading that you have to have gone and read X number of books in the Four Horsemen universe. Yeah. I want you to be able to read rules of engagement and be excited to, you know, climb into a Casper or, you know, play an Ugar or a Besquith and, uh, you know, take to the battlefield or, you know, play a, a squad of peacemakers or mm -hmm. free traders or what have you. Now, I do want I do want to touch on, touch on a bit of the a bit, a bit of the universe. First, for the benefit of the audience, I'd like you to I'd like you to give the brothers and sisters in the temple a bit of a primer on the Four Horsemen universe and what and what style of um what style of SF that they, that can be expected. Well, it is a uh, at its heart a military science fiction universe. Mm -hmm. The core conceit is that in the not too distant future. Aliens make first contact with Earth. They uh, assume that because we launched uh, probes outside of our solar system that we are ready to join the interstellar community. And so they come a knocking, uh, set up a stargate in our system, come down to meet us, and are disappointed. <laughs> it turns out that, that Earth doesn't have uh, you know, great resources. It is woefully behind on technology from what they expected. And uh, we're not even a unified planet. We're still a balkanized uh, world, you know, fighting each other. However, the uh, the delegation doesn't want to, you know, totally write off this mission. After all, it is a significant expense. Mm -hmm. and the Galactic Alliance, if nothing else, is uh, heavily driven by profit. Um, so they come down, start opening up negotiations with the various uh, member nations. And... Um, but one of the things for our contingent uh, joining the uh, Galactic uh, Alliance is that you know we have to get X number of our nation states to sign on. Mm -hmm. Well, the political maneuvering behind that ticks off uh, certain faction of nation states, and so terrorists attack the UN conference and the alien delegation, killing the alien ambassador and uh, some of her bodyguards. The rest of the alien bodyguards don't take kindly to this. They launch a retributive strike against the uh, nation state responsible. And after they finish uh, blasting it from orbit, they send down troops to, to see what they can collect to kind of, you know, mm -hmm. as recompensation. Well, they get down there and the locals, obviously, they fight back. And they fight back with a ferocity and passion, even though they're, they're woefully outclassed on uh, technology. And once the, the replacement ambassador is put in place, they go and meet with a, a human general who had been involved in the talks and actually had tried to save the original alien ambassador. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, we, we fought these uh, soldiers of yours, and they're, they're, they're impressive. You have more like them. And he's like, well, those are just third world terrorists. Those aren't our, our best soldiers. Well, it turns out that the way that conflict works in the Galactic Alliance is that there are no standing armor armies. Mm -hmm. Everything is handled through a guild system, and the main one of that is the Mercenary Guild for handling conflicts. There are th only 36 alien races with the temperament and skill to work as mercenaries. Um, and uh, so humanity becomes a 37th. Mm -hmm. so it turns out that our main export is war and business is good. Now, go forward a century. Humans have been going off world and fighting. We discovered early on that we couldn't match some of those big, scary and alien races out there. There's reasons why good mercenaries. So we invent the combat assault system personal, the Casper, as a way to level a battlefield. Mm -hmm. We are learning, uh, are learning a lot about how war is in conducted. We enjoy a great deal of success. And some of the other alien races aren't happy about this. 
Humanity has this annoying habit of not knowing their place. Mm -hmm. We uh, we think outside the box. We keep fighting when we should surrender. You know, we just don't make sense to them. You know, it's like to them, well, okay, this fight is no longer profitable. It's time to walk away. Well, no, our mercenary companies have a tendency to to fight even in desperate situations, and in fact, that makes them fight even harder. So as we uh, start the Four Horsemen universe and Cartwright's Cavaliers, mm -hmm. uh, there's something going on behind the scenes. Human mercenary companies are all of a sudden starting to go missing or suffer failures that they hadn't before at a much higher rate than before. And that's where we pick up the story in the revelation cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's also basically in the, the first story arc is where rules of engagement is set. That way, we, we set the story at the beginning, so that way, again, you don't have to have read X number of books. You can join the universe just as a new reader would. All right. Um, now, since you mentioned you mentioned that it's very much a military SF, and um, the, and <laughs> having having me, having messed around with a few of the, with a few of those in the in the in this channel. Would it be fair to me to assume that both the both the novels and the and the um, RPG book that you guys are working on has a bit of military humor? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that'd be accurate. Oh, yeah. I, I not too long ago I had the guys from Savage Company on, and they um they had they had relayed th they had relayed some of um some of what's referred to as Sarge's advice. One chief among them is if you if you've got a plan, throw that plan away because that plan sucks. Um, but when it when when it came to when it came to using suede, um, one of the big things that you guys are introducing to that particular sandbox is mech use, and right. what I'm curious about is. Is how you guys are how you guys are going about it because I can see multiple ways of it being done, and some of some of them um, amount to pow amount to of amount to a bit of reskinning. But I get the feeling you guys are going a bit more in depth. Oh, we are the the Caspers is one of the core elements of the Four Horsemen universe. Mm -hmm. That's not to say you can that you can play an entire campaign without ever without ever using a, a Casper. Um, but our readers expect to be able to have the option to, to play a Casper trooper, be able to climb into that armor and, you know, go out into the field, you know, kill aliens and get paid. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the challenges is that Caspers are functionally, they're heavier than uh, what traditional power armor would be in Savage World, which I don't know if you are familiar with the older versions. You probably are. Yes. Like, you know, have the power armor in the older science fiction companion. That wasn't quite robust enough, but I we couldn't have something as heavy as a true heavy vehicle, you know, like tanks. Mm -hmm. We needed something that, you know, the larger aliens could go mano to mano with, um, which is, we're already kind of stretching, you know, uh, credibility a little bit with the fact that, you know, the, Aliens can claw through metal armor, mm. but you can't believe that a werewolf could, you know, claw their way through a tank. So we have a kind of an intermediary scale that falls between heavy and personnel. Oh, the the um, as a follow up to that, given given the fact that you're that you have an inbuilt assumption that the player characters are are um, mer are mercenaries, um. A lot of t a lot of times with mercenaries, you it's not uncommon to see them with um with heavily cust with heavily customized gear. Um, if I need to, to use a um f to use an example of Firefly, consider uh consider Jane's gun Viera. It is not it is very much not a stock firearm. <laughs> um, when it comes to mech customization, is that and I. And I'm using that term just because just because of habit. Is it st is it still is there going to be degrees of cu of customization to support different kinds of loadout? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, there's some Battletech DNA in the Four Horsemen universe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I, you've played Battletech, right? Yeah, I I have enough to enough to know that enough to know that um, clanners suck and never <laughs> trust a Capellan because Capellans ruin everything. They do indeed. Uh, so what? But one of the fun parts of uh, Battletech wasn't just actual combat; it was you know loading out your 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 battle mech. Mm -hmm. You're trying to find that right mix of, of weapons and uh, armor and speed and uh, heat that would. Uh, match your playing style mm -hmm. so the caspers when the caspers first started off um they're pretty much they're a pretty stock frame but as they progress uh there becomes more and more customization options up to the point where uh where we are in the timeline of the full horseman universe where this picks up the mark 7 casper mm -hmm. and the mark 8 uh their weapon loadouts are, are such that uh, the company that makes them doesn't even make a standard loadout anymore. They just have a hard points for you to, you know, decide, okay, what weapons do you want to, to load in? Like an Omni-Mech? Yeah, yeah, a lot like an Omni-Mech. It also lets lets uh, people customize their uh, Caspers for certain roles. For example, if you want a, a faster Casper, well, uh, that's going to take, take some of your options. So if you want to have your armor... That takes some of your options. So, mm -hmm. and there's, so there's a trade-off. And given that, given that, given that, given that sort of um, trade-off thing, since you mentioned that there's some of BattleTech's DNA, I um, I'd like to pick your brain on on that for a few things. One, okay. When it um, do you have some sort of heat system? No. All right. In that, in that being the case, um. When it comes to when it comes to ranged weaponry for Caspers, is it primarily um, is it primarily solid projectile and and explosives or or are there or are there um, energy weapons available? So there's there's two main kinds of, of weapons that are in use in the the, the battlefield. Uh, the first is the laser. Mm -hmm. The laser is good range, great armor piercing. Um, However, not as much damage. There's also some races that have uh, a significant laser defense. Uh, for example, there's an insect race called the, the, the Goka, who are almost immune to lasers. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're chit and refracts it. The other weapon is a magnetic accelerator cannon. You know, think a Gauss rifle. Yeah. Those come in various sizes. Uh, so while they don't have the range of the, of the uh, laser... And they uh, consume; they actually consume more power than a laser. Mm -hmm. uh, they also pack a bigger wallop. Yeah. Um, now you, you mentioned you mentioned so those are the, those are the two primary types. So does does that mean um, miss, does that mean missile weapons are not are not in the cards or are they? There, still there, are, there are there are shoulder mounted uh, rocket launchers effectively. Mm -hmm. um, Part of the problem with long-range missiles and artillery, for that matter, is that the, the point defense systems are such that anything that stays in the air too long gets shot down. It's and re really, in the Four Horsemen universe, um, and combat isn't a, a standoff affair. So there, there's there's not a whole... So um, when you say combat is, is not a standoff affair, am I... Would it be fair of me to say that it's it's not a case of um, a lot of people playing defense, not a whole lot of um, siege, not a whole lot of siege tactics going about? Well, there can be siege tactics. You know, you know, for example, you know, you could be you know charged with you know taking over or you know attacking and seizing a, a, a city or a mining outpost or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you could be on either end of that kind of contract. Um, but, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not two groups sitting miles and miles apart in bunkers with drones and missiles. You know, you, you tend to get up and close and personal because, again, the, the standoff weapons just don't work. They, they, they get shot down. Now, when, it when you mentioned um, Gauss rifles, 
it sound it sounded like that there is instead of a heat management system a power management system is that the case it's reflected in ammunition um and it goes into just a design consideration we're not going to make characters fiddle with like power settings and how many power points do i have this round mm -hmm. and yeah, it's just all built into the ammo system. Yeah. Now, one of the one of the hallmarks and the reason why um, why Mech Warrior Online is so is so CPU heavy is um, is having localized damage instead of a instead of a unified damage approach. Now, Savage Worlds, of course, doesn't have a standard hit point approach. It has a, it has a escalating wound system. Right. Um. Are you going with something similar with Caspers, or do you have some some form of localized damage? So Caspers in and of themselves don't have hit points, but when shots penetrate them, um, they can damage systems and knock systems offline or destroy them. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the whole idea of the Casper is, of course, to keep the uh, operator inside from actually taking those wounds. Um and not every hit is going to, to knock something out in the Casper. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to find that, that balance between the uh, what's reflected in the books where you can see Caspers get shot up, but still, you know, trudge across the battlefield, you know, dragging that, that damaged leg to, to get to that objective and, and take out to the, those uh, Tortantulas. Um, but we didn't want to have something as uh, granular as uh, Battletech, mm -hmm. where you're tracking armor points and all these hit locations. Yeah. yeah. Keeping the spirit of Savage Worlds, we wanted something that goes very fast. Mm -hmm. And because that's that's why I can see why Savage Worlds would would be a natural fit because Savage Worlds is a system that's at its best when you're going, for lack of a better term, pulpy, and um. Four Horsemen is definitely on the pulpy end of science fiction, I would say. Absolutely. It's, you know, it, it's less about the science, it's more about the heroics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so that means that you're here, it's like, the Caspers, they come equipped with arm blades, or they can yeah. come equipped with arm blades. Because, again, there's some alien races that like to get up close and personal. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, pers I'm personally fine with that. I've, met, I've mentioned in the past that... I don't care. I don't care for the fact that a lot of that a lot of the perception of science fiction has be, has been relegated to what a um, friend what a friend of the show has called large men with screwdrivers, and he specifically calls out two thousand one for exacerbating this problem. Um, you know, and that that's not a di that that kind of phrasing is not a dig at Doctor Who. It's more of a lot, a lot. You look at a lot of science fiction, and it's more, of, and it's more about having technical people solving a technical problem, which is nice, but it shouldn't be the standard. Right. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to the different, um, the different races that that ca that can be played within um within rules within rules of engagement. One qu one question that I have is is how do you make sure that they're that they're balanced out that there isn't one that is treated like an alpha? So I basically all the alien races are designed using the Savage Worlds race system. So if you play one of the bigger races, well, you're not going to start off as you know one of the spectacular alpha versions. Mm -hmm. A good example are the Besquith, which are kind of described as the nightmare that ate grandma. You know, picture a, a big werewolf with a metal rending claws and a mouthful of shark teeth. However, Besquith have different stages. They, they have the, the gammas, which are the smallest, mm -hmm. the betas, which are, are more of your, would be like your uh, kind of mid-level uh, battlefield leaders, like your sergeants and stuff, your enlisted officers. And then you have your alphas, which are very rare and which are you know, kind of big and scary. Well, they're all big and scary, but they are the big scary ones that, you know, are the ones that everyone talks about. Mm -hmm. That's not to say, you you know, you want to run into a best with Gamma in a dark alley, but uh, it is balanced out. So that way, a starting human character and a starting best with Gamma mm -hmm. 
-hmm. are built on the same number of race points, for example. And now, when now, um, what one of the one of the ish, one of the um other issues that that I'm cur that I'm curious about is obvious. Obviously, this is still building on the on the core um, book for Suede, but there's still there, but there's still going to be some additions in of itself. And when it came to when it came to things like say edges. You know the the big one of the biggest backbones of character creation and making your character special within um, within the Savage World system. What what was what's what was your defining line to make to make sure that a that an edge wasn't already covered in the uh, core book? Well, obviously, I mean, I have the core book as a reference. <laughs> well, obviously, there's that, but make but making sure and that it, a I'm a, I'm a I may have used. Uh, so I run a uh, Firefly campaign using Savage World, mm -hmm. and some of the edges I may have you know used my players as uh, stealth playtesters for guinea pigs. Yeah, <laughs> to see if if it would uh, unbalance things. And the goal is, you know, I don't want to have uh, a bunch of power creep. Mm -hmm. Like if you remember. D&D, every new book that came out seemed to make the characters more powerful. Yeah. Well, I don't want to introduce an edge where everyone goes, oh, I have to have that. And If you see all your players taking the same edge, mm -hmm. there's probably something wrong with the edge. Yeah, it's some... Um... I have I have often I have often described balancing as as walking as walking a tightrope over a bed of spikes. Um <laughs> but when it com when when it comes to when it came to certain edges were there were there any instances during that stealth playtesting where there was a edge design that you had that it seemed like you had a good idea but your players found an exploit that you didn't um exactly account for? Not with those, and they're usually pretty good at exploiting stuff. Um, I, I think because I worked so hard to mirror um, the structure of existing edges um, rather than go totally left field. Mm -hmm. uh, and mostly these were, were thematic to, to address things that, that weren't necessarily covered already in Savage Worlds. I mean, Savage Worlds has, has a really solid system already, yeah. but... When you know, I was looking at characters in the books and stuff. For example, uh, there's an edge called Nanite Therapy. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all Casper troopers have Nanite Therapy. It's this hardening treatment that helps them endure the rigors of operating these you know one-ton uh, machines. And so there is obviously a benefit to it, uh, but it is not something that is so overwhelming that if you're playing a non-Casper trooper, you're going to be like, well, I need to take Nanite and therapy too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I wanted to introduce edges that fit concepts rather than power builds. Now, one of the one of the other um one of the one of the edges that I see on the I see on the example page on the Kickstarter that I'm I'm curious about is cybernetics because obviously this isn't the first rodeo with Savage Worlds and doing and doing something in high or gonzo science fiction. And the ones that have done cybernetics have each had their own interpretation. So I'm curious how cybernetics is going to work for rules of engagement. So cybernetics in the Four Horsemen universe, while they exist, mm -hmm. they are they are not predominant other than uh, what's called pin plants, which are uh, machine brain interfaces. Mm -hmm. um, pin plants allow you to, for example, plug directly into your Casper or to... Uh, wire a gun in so that you see the, the targeting reticle in your actual field of vision. Um, there are, you know, for example, uh, one of the characters I write, uh, Bjorn Tovison from Bjorn's Berserkers, he has a cybernetic arm because he got mauled as a teenager and, and lost that arm. Um, and while it is, it is stronger than, you know, a flesh and blood arm, it does give him advantages. It's not something crazy. You know, he's still a human with a, a human skeletal structure, he can't, like, say, you know, flip a tank with or something like that because, well, you could try it and just, you know, probably tear his arm right off of his shoulder. Mm -hmm. 
But because we have some cybernetics in the Four Horsemen universe, I wanted to make sure that players that really had that as part of their character concept could do that. Yeah. Um, and ob- obviously, one of the big elephants in the room regarding cybernetics is how it's is how it's treated in, say, Shadowrun or or Cyberpunk um, Red. Um, and when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to that, um, aside from aside from just how ju- just the limited amount of edges that you're gonna that you're gonna have, is there any significant drawback to having multiple cybernetics? Not so far as well. To have cybernetics, we're gonna it's gonna be based on an edge. Mm-hmm. So you're on a budget. So are you gonna sync your advancements into improving your cybernetics or you know building your skills? Because again, we want to keep characters on a level playing field. We don't want everyone going, oh shoot, I have to play a cyborg. Yeah. You know, very few characters in the universe have cybernetics other than uh, again the pin plants mm-hmm. and. You know, we don't have, you know, there's not things where you go in and, you know, you get your, your kidney replaced with a turbo booster and you get subdermal armor and you get your eyes gouged out and with cybernetic eyes. But now we're there, not there doing isn't... street Sam's. Yes, we're not doing street samurais. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes now, um. With a lot of with a lot of the with a lot of the combat and a lot of the mechanics, we've fo- the focus so far has been on the, has been on the ground based affairs. So I'd like to pivot a bit and ask about space combat. So space combat, we're not going to go into in detail, uh, partly because of the, the size of the book, mm-hmm. um, something like that. We'll have a, a system using the Savage Worlds chase system. Um, one of the dangers of space combat is it's a good way to TPK. Especially if you're on a smaller ship. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you're gonna have combat for, with your you know, your dropship and another ship, well, if your dropship keeps blowing up, then you're all probably dead. Okay, time for a new campaign. Or at least all new characters. Now, if uh, rules of engagement does do well, mm-hmm. then uh, we're, we're talking about doing a, a space-based uh, supplement that'll go more into space combat. Because one of the four horsemen units is the Wing Hussars, who specialize in space combat. I do have to, since they're called the Wing Hussars, I do have to ask if they st- if they still put. Do they still put do they put a lot of wing decals on their on their ships? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the reason why it's called the Four Horsemen Universe mm-hmm. is that during the Alpha contracts, which was the first round of mercenary contracts off of Earth, mm-hmm. one hundred units went out on uh, the first round of contracts, the Alpha contracts. Only four units came home, and all four of them at the time had horses in their insignias. One of those being the winged hussars. And so they became known as the Four Horsemen. And they kind of became the de facto leaders of the Earth mercenary industry going forward. All right, I, I, I got you. It's, cer- it's, certainly, it's certainly not exactly what a lot of people are probably going to think when they hear, when they hear Four Horsemen, but I'm perfectly willing to work with that. So would, would it be fair to say that those are the four big movers and shakers when it comes to the... Um, world of the mercenary world? Yes. Um, I mean, the first four books are based on the four Four Horsemen units. Uh, Cartwright's Cavaliers, which is the first book, Mm -hmm. and uh, founder James Cartwright is actually the one that's responsible for uh, the creation of the Caspers. Uh, The Wing Hussars, who who came back uh, from their mission with a a totally different ship than they left in. Uh, Asbrand Solutions, and uh, the Golden Horde which the Golden Horde actually uh, arose from a, a rather sketchy organization in Uzbekistan. Mm-hmm. Now, oh, so, sorry, I didn't mean, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So they, they basically became the gold standard for mercenary companies. Mm-hmm. And because of the amount of money that mercenary companies bring into Earth, they're kind, I mean, mercenaries are kind of like a, 
almost rock stars. Except rock stars that, you know, have to fight giant aliens on and uh, get shot at with lasers and stuff. And it's very much a, a live fast, uh, die hard mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, given, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure they, I'm pretty sure they'd probably appreciate um, a song, a song similar to the Battle Hymn of the Mech Warrior. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing that one thing that I'm curious about, since you mentioned dropship, is there's, and given the whole BattleTech DNA that's that we've discussed, one. Um, are warships a thing, or are or is that, or are they not really all that present? And they are two, absolutely a thing. Oh, they are. Oh, they are a thing. The Winged Hussars specialize. They're they're a, a warship mercenary outfit. They they specialize in that. Right. Now, not all mercenary companies have warships. In fact, most of them don't. Mm-hmm. They they have uh, arm they have armed transports. But those are, you know, designed to survive long and, you know, survive to get your your troops into orbit so you can drop them, as opposed to slug it out with other warships. Mm-hmm. Now, now the other question that I have is on FTL travel, and every SF setting that I've come that I've come across has their own, has their own variation of it. Some of them. Go full, go full on light speed. Some of them, it's jump points. Some of them, it's it's uh, diving into subspace. Um, how how does FTL travel work in the Four Horsemen universe? So the 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 primary form of FTL travel in the Four Horsemen universe is through stargates. You go through a stargate to uh, transition your ship to hyperspace. Mm-hmm. Uh, sh- most ships can't actually shunt themselves into hyperspace on their own. They have to go through a stargate. However, there are a few that do. Uh, one of the, the strange dynamics in the Four Horsemen universe is that once you're in hyperspace, actually, the greater your mass, the less power it takes to keep you there. So uh, small hyperspace-capable ships aren't practical. You're not going to have, like, say, you know how you have in Star Wars where you have the X-Wings with hyperdrives. Mm-hmm. You don't have the Four Horsemen universe. So, give, given the, given that when he, when you mention stargates, is it, are they are th- is it a case where it's specific coordinates that they're allowed to jump, or are they actual structures, a la the gates in say Fading Suns or Cowboy Bebop? They're they're actual physical gates, and they're set up at a Lagrange point in the solar system, mm-hmm. and and it all depends on when the first stargate system is activated. That sets up both. Where that Stargate is, which has to be in uh, one of the the L3 or L4, I believe it is, Lagrange points. I don't want to mess this up because I actually messed it up in a book. Um, And then the opposite Lagrange point from that becomes the emergence point for that system. Mm -hmm. So when a ship enters a system out of hyperspace, it emerges there. Now, when we say emergence point, it's not, you know, a singular point in space. It's a, a... but it's a small, very small volume of space. So that's how uh, systems organize their defenses is around their emergence. Mm-hmm. And I'm, ge- I'm guessing that I'm guessing that even with even with all the conflicts, there's a understood agreement that no that nobody tries to attack the gates. Correct. If you attack a Stargate, the Cartographer Guild will cut you off from uh, the whole gate network. And if that happens, the the only thing that you'd have the only thing you'd have is just normal thrusters and dealing with the fact that space is really, 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 really fucking big. Yeah, um, yeah. Ships are are in normal space are limited to relativistic travel, and there's only you know so much acceleration that your crews can endure, and even with you know uh, the the highly efficient fusion engines we have in the full horsemen universe. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, you're not going to go uh, between stars using those. Yeah. Um, since you, another thing that I've, I, I'm curious about when it comes to drop ships, is it a case where, a, um, where a warship itself won't par- won't park on a planet, but it'll send it, but more often than not, it'll send a drop ship. Right, because larger ships uh, can't land. 
there's a, a size limitation on that. Um, you have, you know, some ships, medium-sized transports that can land mm -hmm. and deliver troops directly to the surface. But like generally, your warships can't, um, and your your really big transports can't. Yeah. Now you mentioned that the that the that um that merc that mercenary work is decided by a guild. Um, yes. How do, how does that structure kind of work? Is it a case where some somebody signs on, they'll get jo they'll um they'll get jo they'll get jobs recommended to them, and the more successful jobs they get, the more higher paying ones that they'll be offered. As a general, yeah, actually, there's there's what throughout the galaxy there's what's called merc pits, where uh, uh, prospective employers send you know uh, contracts and. Uh, basically fishing for, for mercenary companies that look at that contract and go, okay, I can do that job for that pay. Uh, sometimes there there's bidding, um, but you know there's always a caveat emptor. If you hire the cheapest mercenary unit, you're probably going to get what you pay for. In more ways than one. Yeah. Also, you're, you're, uh, you're probably not going to get your money back or your merc back or their weapons back because they're probably dead. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and but you know you're you're very correct in that you know the, the more successful merc mercenary companies then become more sought after. Mm -hmm. Where you know if you have a you know, particularly uh, troublesome contact uh, contract, you may actually go okay. You know what? I want to find you know Cartwright's Cavaliers or Bjorn's Berserkers and hire them specifically for this contract. Given the given the given the whole thing with with um, like I like I said, it's very clear that there's a under there's a unspoken understanding that player characters are going to be mercenaries. So my next not necessarily. Um, one of the things we, we're going to talk about in the book is there are more things to do in the Four Horsemen universe than, than to be a mercenary. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of the focus is around mercenaries because that's what a lot of the books are focused about. All right. Uh, for example, we have a, a entire storyline of books in the Forceman universe that focuses on the uh, Peacemakers, which is kind of your galactic police force. Mm -hmm. Kind of uh, space marshals, I guess would be a good term. Yeah. All right that that make that makes sense, and I'll will correct myself on that front. But since you meant since you mentioned Peacemakers, um, given given the given the kind of setting that's involved here, I'm curious if there if um. Pirates are also are also a problem. Absolutely. Uh, they, you know, again, because you know you have uh, the emergence points. Mm -hmm. You know, pirates you know may lurk you know, either in the vicinity of the uh, emergence point if it's not defended, or you know since it's a predictable route from the emergence point to wherever the world is in its orbit, they may lurk somewhere along there. Uh, there's one race called the Pushtal who are notorious for being pirates. Mm -hmm. You know, picture of basically uh, bipedal Siberian tigers as pirates. Yeah, that that makes that makes bear cavalry seem like seem like an average seem like an average day in the office. <laughs> um, especially especially if especially if those bipedal bears are are heavily armed with whatever whatever firearm they feel like carrying. Oh yeah, one of the big things about the Ugar and the Javul, who are the two big Ursine races, is oh yeah, they can carry heavy weapons as infantry weapons. So it it wouldn't be, it wouldn't it probably wouldn't be out of, out of the ordinary for them to carry around a man portable version of a howitzer. <laughs> yeah, well, or, or or effectively the the magnetic accelerator cannons, mm -hmm. you know, or a laser that would normally be mounted on a tripod. Well, you know, an Ugor can pick that up and carry it around. And I'm get I'm get I'm guessing that I'm guessing that that's one of that's listed in one of their natural features that that um weapons that would normally that would normally be immobile they can ca they can carry. Exactly. Um. Now. With that kind of thing in mind, so we we've mentioned mercenaries, we've mentioned peacemakers, we've talked we've talked about pirates. Um, what other what other ma what other major factions could could you um, reasonably see player characters um, as? Um, there's always the whole you know classic traveler you know uh, merchant group. 
you know, where you're, you're, you know, taking speculative trade in, in possibly dangerous places. Uh, there could be a, a market for troubleshooters, um, where you know you hire out to deal with specific problems, like say, for example, pirates. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of the uh, the tropes that are in you know your classic science fiction games, mm -hmm. and you could be explorers trying to you know, find new worlds for the merchant guild, because of course you know that always goes smooth. Now, since you since you mentioned since you mentioned the whole world exploring, do you have do you have plans on putting say a ra a random world generator or some equivalent? That is something that will depend on how much space we end up with in the book. Because mm -hmm. as we hit uh, stretch goals, the the book gets larger. Um, and as we've seen also from uh, the exoplanet surveys, you know, you remember back in Traveler, those little random charts you would roll on to generate a random solar system? Yeah. Looking at what's coming back from exoplanet surveys, those don't seem so insane now. I in fact, a, a lot of the solar systems we're finding are actually around smaller stars with mm -hmm. closer orbits, which is much more conducive to, uh, you know, mercenary combat operations you know for earth to get from the stargate to a orbit it's going to be a few days at 1g acceleration mm -hmm. but for a you know a, a class m red dwarf you know it could be a matter of a few hours so that that certainly makes sense now what now now um I had noticed that one that one of the early stretch goals that you unlocked was increasing the book size to 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 um two hundred and fifty six um pages. Um which 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 answers one of the questions I was gonna ask as far as how as far as how big you, you were um shoot you were shooting for, but what would you what would you be aiming for as far as a release window of the PDF version? The PDF version, um, well, our general goal is to deliver in um, June of next year, June of 2022. Um, and knock on wood, nothing, nothing happens between now and then to delay that. Because as we see with lots of game projects, you, you run the delays. However, um, we're using a domestic printer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, because some uh, Kickstarters, you know, you, if they get printed overseas, if something happens, then... It gets, you know, stuck in, you know, customs or whatever, or in shipment. Um, so, really, the, the, the biggest slowdowns will be, of course, how long it takes me to, to, to and uh, Mark and, you know, a couple other writers we may corral for, for pieces mm -hmm. to, uh, to finish up the, the rules and the background information. Um, the art will be probably the biggest timepiece um, because we, we can't contract the art contract out the art until we know uh, how big the book is and how much money we have and our, our goal is because one of the things we we'll do with this book is make it a source book not just for gamers because we have a lot of readers who go well hey what does this race look like what does that race look like mm -hmm. so we want to have as much art as we can afford in this book and so once we then so once we know exactly how many art pieces we have then we'll contract those out um and, you know, then you have to kind of weigh, if you have fewer artists doing more pieces, well, that will take them longer. However, you also have a more consistent look for the book. Mm -hmm. if you know. Whereas if you have a whole bunch of artists and each of them do a few pieces, then you might lose some of your, your, your design cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. that, cer that, certainly makes that certainly makes sense. Um, that be... That being said, I do want I do want to give my congratulations on on you guys getting funded with plenty of with plenty of time to spare because at the time of this recording you've only got twenty six days left. Yeah, well, one of the reasons why we set the uh, funding window the way we did mm -hmm. was because we launched at Fantasy, which is a convention in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and basically it was the first convention back from the plague that shall not be named. Mm -hmm. However, there is another convention coming up, LibertyCon, and even though that one's still virtual this year, 
as a very military science fiction heavy uh, campaign with a lot of four horsemen uh, fans. And so we wanted to make sure that it w went through that convention as well to make sure that the word, word got out to everyone, um, drive as much traffic as possible. Mm -hmm. Also to give people time, you know, to, um, you know, you know, make sure their paychecks come in at, and so forth. Cause you know, with you know, our current quote unquote unprecedented times, you know, some people's paydays may be less predictable than normally. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure everyone has that wants to, to get in on this project has the opportunity to do so. I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get behind that. Um, and let, and I'll be I'll be looking forward to seeing how it develops. And in the interest of full disclosure, of the 228 backers so far, you can count me under that under that list. Awesome. Um, Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Because I um, maybe it's, maybe it's because of the, maybe it's because of the fact that I had a I had a fondness for both the book and film version of Starship Troopers. But I've always I've always had a bit I've always had a bit of an interest in that in the more gonzo end of military SF. Um, not the, in part, in part because the, in part because the, um, to be quite honest, a lot of times when, when, so, when some authors use um, military in their science fiction, they do, they, they do it the exact same way. The whole horrors of war approach, which I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to, but I, have I have a bit of a fondness towards the darker hu towards darker humor. Um, and well, I, I can say that Heinlein's uh, Starship Troopers was uh, an inspiration for for Mark, who created the universe. Yeah. I I think two of his his big influences was Heinlein's Starship Troopers and uh, BattleTech. I can I can definitely I can definitely see the D the DNA in that. Um, I was gonna say either that or Battle Lords of the Twenty Third Century, but that one's a little bit obscure. That's old school. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, isn't that the kind of basically the the predecessor of BattleTech? Um, it's or was a, it just for it? It's it's really close to it's really close to the line. Um, Battle Lords was a, was a was. A fairly li a fairly limited run, but they came they came out around the same general general time in their in their first editions. But part of the the other reason it, it's a kind of chicken and egg situation is BattleTech started out as a war game and then um mute and then mutated over into role playing games and Where books. It, yeah, and and books and and all that other stuff, but the but the bulk of it, but the bulk of its material has always been in the war game. Um. Whereas Battle Lords of of the twenty third century has always been an RPG first and foremost. That's what that's why it, that's why it's that's why it's kind of hard to to say which came first. Um. Although what although although as far as I know, Battle Lords never went through any never went through any legal drama, so it's got that going for it. There is that <laughs> because I because as I am legally required to say, "Fuck you, Harmony Gold." I still hate you. <laughs> um, but with all with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And, it's been a pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether whether it's to go further into the Four Horsemen universe or just or just to shit post about what about why um, Capellans ruin everything, um, <laughs> the door is always open. Thank and, you. As as I as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged, especially in this kind of weather. I can get on board with that. And of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the insanity. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>